Okay, uh, we're starting to record. Um, and let's see, I'm going to share. You should be seeing slides. Pizza. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, remember to uh, turn off your uh, to turn on your video if you're comfortable, especially when you're speaking, um, and also mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, uh, encourage you to join the Meetup channel in Triple NYC Slack. We'll be using that instead of the Zoom chat. Uh, and uh, we have two talks today. We have a lightning talk by Daryl, and uh, an automated testing talk from David. Uh, and uh, thank you to Holing and JD who helped us get this first lunch and learn um, off the off the concept into a, an actual event. Um, and you, know, you probably are following us on social media in our Slack channel, but if you're not, um, please join us. Also, please do support the Drupal Association. Uh, I don't know where we would be without Drupal.org. It's hard, don't even want to think about it. Um, so, so it's Drupal Fest um, all throughout April. It's the 20th anniversary of the uh, beginning of Drupal. Um, so we're on their calendar, this event today, but other things that are coming up, um, there's a accessibility uh, event coming up uh, in a few days. Uh, Diversity and Inclusion Camp is coming up in June and decoupled days will be coming up in July and the call for papers is still open. So if you have anything that you've been doing that involves, uh, it doesn't have to be a completely like React built front end, just anything that's 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 progressively decoupled um, or, or JavaScript-y uh, in terms of consuming uh, content from Drupal, um, the, get a paper in. Um, and uh, decoupled days has made a commitment to uh, having a, a large hunk of the speaking staff this year um, be from persons who are less commonly represented among speakers. So uh, it, uh, I commend them for that. And uh, uh, if you know someone uh, who wouldn't ne necessarily look like a typical conference speaker in years past, um, encourage them to get a paper in. Uh, JD uh, uh, got us going today and then dropped, but uh, you know, that group is doing a fabulous job getting camp organized. Um, there's a high probability that we might be able to be in person um, for camp because it's scheduled for the mid fall. Um, and it's a completely 100% volunteer effort. So uh, I encourage you to join the camp organized channel in Drupal Slack and uh, uh, help us put on camp this year. Um, our website needs help. Um, uh, it was static um, and hosted on GitHub. And when we formed Drupal NYC Incorporated to support Drupal, we kind of thought it should be running on Drupal. Um, so it is, um, but it's an off the shelf theme, barely customized and, and like two content types just to say that we're on Drupal. Um, so if you have any uh, love to give to our website, uh, join the website channel and um, help us do it right. Uh, Thank you to our speakers today. We always need speakers. So if you know someone or you are someone, um, please email us. And I think that is all of our opening commercials. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Joe. Hello? Hey, we can hear you, Daryl. You're good to go. Cool. Um, check everything. So, all right, so <clears throat> hello everyone. So my name is Daryl Sutlight. Um, I love the opening. I love the React talk. Um, it's actually something I've been trying to focus on over the past uh, two months or whatever. Um, and I, I love the fact that you guys are even talking about decoupled and look for new presenters because that's one way I learned I'm trying to uh, use React 
to in a very decoupled fashion to build my first um, mobile app and the data store might be Drupal. Um, that's not 100% yet. So um, that's just a great transition. Just the fact of talking about how you need 15 years of experience because I'm experiencing that now being uh, on the market. It's a challenge, but uh, that's another lightning talk for another day. So this talk um, will be about a Drupal 8 module that I want to eventually contribute to uh, the open source community. And it was inspired by some Drupal 7 work I did at a previous job. Um, this one's more flexible, a lot more better, um, even though I'm only going to demo really one version um, or one portion of it. So uh, I guess I need to share screen. Yeah. Find the right screen. Yeah, I think it's going to be this one. Hope it's this one. <laughs> All right, can everyone see that so far? Thumbs up, excellent. Yes. So um, I was trying to think of a cool name, something that stands out that was different. Um, IP Ranger is kind of what I settle with right now. Small chance I may change. So there are other modules in the community that are similar. I don't think it, I think they either do too much or not enough or focus on something slightly different. So the entire purpose of this module is to flag a site user on a page load or any given page load <clears throat> to determine or to flag them if they're in network or off network. So what does that mean? In network just means that the user is on one of your IP addresses or within a range of IP addresses for your job, company, firewall, or whatever. Um, you might be on a VPN, you know, a uh, company VPN, so you're on network. Now, there might be various business logics that need to be applied. This is where I think uh, other modules try to like force what that business logic is. I'm not forcing that. All I'm doing is associating the user session with in network or out of network. And then I'm allowing developers to just check the, uh, the user session and then do whatever they want with it. So um, when you talk about in network and out network, we're talking about IP addresses, right? So there's basically two types. You have your IP4 and your IP6. IP6 is more new. It's not exactly new, but it's more new. IP4 is still probably more common. Um, you know, it's, it's been around longer. When we think of IP addresses with our homes where, you know, everyone has a certain type of number in mind. So right here is how an IP4 will look. Um, here's how an IP version six will look. And so those are two types, but also these, when we talk about IP addresses, we all think about a certain like number. So when we talk about CIDRs or CIDRs, however you want to call it, um, that's just a range. It's a notation for a range of IP addresses. So you have CIDRs for IP uh, version fours and IP version six. So when you want to be in, you want to flag someone in or off networks, there's basically two types of things you have to do. You either, let's just talk about IP4s. You either need a list of known IP4 addresses, and you need to see if the current user's IP address is in that list, right? If there are, they're in your network. If they're not, they're out of network. But obviously, especially for you know um, large scale companies, you might have a set of IP addresses for Europe that you use. You know, any Microsoft probably has it for Brazil, for for um, Asia, you know? Um, so you can't go one IP address at a, at a time. You need to have these ciders, these, these ranges 
that you're talking about. So what the business logic does behind the scenes is on every page load, it flags the user's IP address. And then for each range, it gets the range and finds the minimum of that range and the maximum of that range. And then it does some business logic magic to say, if this IP address is within that range, and then it loops through every single one of your IP4 um, ciders. And if it's in if it's in one of those ranges, it flags it as within in a range. So this entire module um, basically does that for IP46. If I had a list of ranges here separated just by a new line. It will loop through look at the current IP address was on printing out here. So locally, mine is 192.168.01. And it'll see if it's in this range. If it is, it'll flag it as no. Um, it'll do the same thing for IP version six, but obviously it's never going to be um, you know, in that range potentially. Um, and then for IP version four, instead of looking for the ranges, it kind of treats it just as an array. It takes the entire array of all of these separated on one line, and it just does an in array kind of lookup. And obviously, uh, basically kind of the same thing for IP version six. So um, a lightweight lightning talk example. Um, so right now, this is returning true because this is my IP address for my local host. And this is what I have stored um, in my configuration setting. So if I remove this and probably clear cache twice, it should return false. Usually I pre record all these things. This was not the case this time. I hate live demos. Um, yeah, so this will have to kind of like just do it twice because it's, it's keeping the old data. All right, so now this should return false as expected. And I'll just put it back real quick. Hit save. Time. Sure. So I put it back. Okay. So um, since we're all friends, we can say, take my word for it that it'll, in theory, work the same for, uh, which is probably more important for the ciders as well. Um, I don't have IP4 six addresses to um, kind of test this with now, but I, I did test it before with IP4. Um, ciders. Um, I'm using I'm using Composer with my modules to pull in um, a Symphony library that um, does the heavy lifting as far as converting an IP address into a numeric value and an IP range into a numeric value for IP version four and IP version six. So um, there's still some issues that naturally will just come up with this. So. The very first thing is, I mentioned here, this is my IP address uh, for my local host. This is just Drupal doing what Drupal does, Drupal's business logic. This is going to be problematic because one, you're, you know, you have to take in consideration for local hosts. Um, additionally, your IP address is going to, your, your logic to determine your IP address is going to be different based on your environment. And one example of that is using a CDN. So a CDN uh, like Cloudflare may um, generate your IP address for you. So you can't, that was the first bug, the first time I did this at a previous job that was hard to catch right away. Um, you can't rely on Drupal's business logic to determine what your user's IP address is if there's a CDN that's interfering. And you can't always use the CDN logic because you're not using a CDN for all the environments. At my previous job, we used the CDN for our staging environment. 
and for our production environment. So the logic needed to know when to change based on where the code was running. So um, that's something that a, a, a feature I would need to um, add in um, in the future. Another thing that happens is, as you can see, the logic is heavily dependent on addresses being here. So what happens when you're doing a new insult? The addresses aren't there right away. And your insult file, cool, you could kind of like, um, or in your variables or whatever, you can store things, but every time you spin up a new site, you know, a uh, release candidate site, um, you might need to have new files. So let's say, because I had experiences, let's say the business logic was you, you need to, if you're off network and you're an admin, you need to, um, sorry, if you're an admin, you're trying to log into the site, but you're not on, um, you're out of network, you need to be logged out. You're always gonna be logged out if you spin up a new site right away because you know, you're, you're being flagged as off network. Um, another issue that comes up is you may not have all the lists of your um, IP addresses or IP ranges. It may not be known. So what happens when it's like a false positive, I guess, your business logic is fine, but you just, since you don't have all the updated lists of your um, addresses, you still get logged out, you know? So one thing um, I think I would like to do in the future is instead of kind of like hard coding somewhere in the code, whether it be in the configurations, you know, or a YAML file somewhere, or what certain addresses to use during install, um, I think it might be more beneficial to maybe, you know, make like an API call where there's a master list and some data stores someplace else and doing an install, it pulls it in. This way you have a one, one stop shop of all your ranges that you're, you can constantly update and every single new site that gets spun up at any given time is pulling in the same information. This way you're not dealing with outdated and outdated lists of IP ranges um, because that can potentially cause business logic for you when there's a range that you don't know about. So um, yes, that's, that's another feature I will have um, in the future. But um, part of the reason why, you know, I wanted to do this lightning talk with my gone over five minutes by now is I really wanted to get feedback from other people of how they might use this. Like what scenarios would you like to see or can you think of where determining whether you're in or off network is important and how are you using it? Obviously for marketing reasons, um, they wanna know how users are using their site and it's important to know if, um, if there's just a regular user or someone who has, who's like an employee. So how do you determine employee either by the role that they sign in with or if you're on a network, you're either like a partner or employee and in network people might be using your site or application differently from out of network people. So that's my uh, slow thunderstorm lightning talk. Great, well, we have probably five minutes or so. People have uh, questions or feedback for Daryl. So Daryl, I was just uh, gonna ask what motivated you to to write this module? Sure, so um, like I said, I was um, at our previous job, we were actually doing some site tracking, um, like site analytics type of work. So we had a, a third party, uh, it wasn't Google Analytics, it was something else. I can't remember the name at the moment. Um, and we implemented that. So we're tracking how users are using site and the product owner at the time um, basically had a need for knowing how our 
it was misleading the way it was said at this time, but knowing how out of network people were using the site, what she, what she really meant at the time was people who had certain roles were using the site. Um, but so we basically had to figure out like, well, how, how do we, how do we know how our, you know, people who are out of network are using the site um, without knowing like, a list of IP addresses and the curveball at the time was nobody knew what our IP addresses were. <laughs> nobody knew our ranges. So I had to like hunt down uh, the data, our data scientists, our just a lot of different people. And then in confluence, I just created like a master list and I was using that. And um, so I was the person who kind of like figured it out. And there was also some other business logic as far as like if you're an admin for security reasons, if someone had the admin's username and password, they were they were not able to log in unless they were on our network. You know, so that was like an extra security flag. And um, so I had to figure out um, for that reasons, for that security reason, how to kick someone out of the site or prevent them from going to certain pages if they had an admin privileges but wasn't on the network and also had to figure out how to um have all the tracking data we were collecting how to determine who was on on the network and off the network so um you can't just do an employee because an employee can be on the network and then log out log out from vpn or go home or be on their phone and log in and they're still an employee, but now they're off network, you know? So um, basically uh, the, need, the, the need from the product owner um, ended up being a challenge. And the security one was more important because if we didn't get that security thing fixed, we'd be, this, the whole entire site would have been shut down within 30 days. So um, that's, that's how I came, I came back to it. But at the time, it was it was very coupled with the site tracking, um, and and this whole in network off network. So before I left, I had to kind of like extract some and put it in, in this own module. And then um, now, since I've a lot of free time since I'm on employee because of COVID, I was like, I could do this a lot better, and I could do this in Drupal eight. And when I checked this, the other Drupal eight modules, they were doing stuff that was similar, but like I said, it wasn't. It wasn't, they were either doing too much or forcing you to do something once they flag you on in their off network. So um, I didn't want to force anybody who installed this module to do certain things. I just wanted to stick to like the core of what the issue was and allow them to, once they had that flag, to apply whatever business logic that they needed. So, so Daryl, I unfortunately missed the first couple of minutes first two minutes or so of your, of your presentation, this is finished something else. Does this block people from just the admin area or blocks them from the site? No, 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 I was just kind of giving that as an example. It doesn't, I, I don't force people to get blocked. I don't lock them out at all. All, all I'm doing- No, no but, is, but, but this can allow. So if I have a dev site uh, that I only want my client to see and, and want other people, I can add their IP addresses and they only they can see it. So rather than using an HD access, to do it, I can, I can use this? Yes, you'll have to do a little logic, a little work. So you can use IP address to, to flag if they're in or off network. And then you would have to say like, all right, well, if the session says they're all, they're out of network, then do this, log them out, redirect them, something. Now this, this is just a just... metadata module, right? It provides metadata about network status. Basically. Yeah, basically, yeah. So, sure, um, cool. so go ahead, Scott. No, I thought this was allowed. It says if, you, if your IP address is not listed here, you can't access the site or the back ends. No, 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 no. It's, um, you, it, it, it won't take that much coding to do that. Like, you could probably just do that in a couple lines. Like, hey, if, if you're out of network, if, is page is admin, you know, redirect or whatever. Um, 
So like, I'm not, I'm not forcing people to not be an admin, but with, like I said, just with a couple more lines of code, you, you can, you can do that. Because there, because there was once one, I know, and I, I got to check. There's one a while back that did that, that um, only allows for an IP address, which is great when you go into development. So you can show a client something and you don't have to worry about other people getting in. I got a case right now where the site can't be seen by anyone and I have to put it between the HT access. And every time I do that, I get the email, what's the password again? And they can so I'm going to pause this, Scott, because we want to give David enough time for his talk. Okay. <clears throat> but it's a sign of a good talk, Daryl, if we if we have questions that want to keep going on and people want to talk about uh, your work. And this is cool. It's well done. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, All right. Do I stop share or do you stop? Yeah. You No, you stop sharing and uh, then we give David a chance. And David, welcome. Um, uh, David's going to talk to us about testing. Cool. Can you share my screen? So thank you for the opportunity to speak here. For me, the New York Drupal meetup is my Drupal community. I'm living in Peru. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a developer from Australia. So for the last 10 years, I've been working for a Christian mission organization in Peru. Um, during COVID, one of the opportunities for me is I can take part in a meetup in New York, even though I'm several thousand kilometers away. Um, so testing, um, why do we need to do testing? Because things break. I think with a lot of content focused site, adding tests may not add a lot of value, but I've now had a, a couple of examples where I wished I had some tests. Um, so for example, quite recently, I enabled a new module, added some functionality and I tested everything I uh, that was, I was directly changing. And I also tested what I thought could be affected. But when, when the change went to production, the next morning I got a, call, got a message from one of our content people that they couldn't save a particular content type. And I immediately knew what the problem was. But it, it was one of these things where if I had a set of tests, I might've been able to catch this beforehand. And I've always thought that um, doing automated tests are uh, too complicated, would take too much time. I had played around with Selenium before. Um, I've tried a few different um, web driver IO as well, um, but never committed deeply enough to get a system working for me. I'm still on this journey, and I'm sure some of you have got a lot more experience than me with automated testing. So I'd love to get some questions and some feedback at the end. Uh, so very quickly, there are a few different types of tests we can automate a test we can do. We can do unit tests where you want to check functions. So a tool like PHP unit will give you, um, will let you test specific functions. Uh, integration tests are where you want to test, for example, a function um, and, and its connection with a database or testing different functions together. We're going to focus on end to end testing where you want to test the system like a user. It's sometimes called black box testing because you basically don't have any knowledge of the system. You are, are testing using a, normally a browser and testing the entire system working together. Cool, so I'm using Puppeteer and Jest. And so why these two tools when there are so many tools out there? I'm sure you've heard of WebDriver.io, Cypress, Nightbot.js. Uh, I basically Google what was the simplest way to do testing. And there were lots of blog posts, lots, lots of articles that said that if your main focus was Chrome, then Puppeteer is, is the simplest way to do testing. Um, and now Puppeteer will actually let you test with Firefox as well though with, with some limitations. And Jest is a testing framework built by Facebook. It's um, fairly new, and it's also supposed to be a, a very easy framework to use. 
So Puppeteer really had, was very easy to set up. Um, if you've got Node and NPM uh, already in your machine, it's just one line to add it to your, your project. And I'm just gonna do a, a very quick demo with uh, our Drupal Camp website. So if I open that site, We're going to do a very um, simple test where I will open the home page, take a screenshot, and then I'll open, click on this link and take another screenshot. So let me grab a project. This is kind of the standard boilerplate for Puppeteer, where um, we have a function. You'll see in the Puppeteer, you'll see a lot of this async uh, and await because. Um, we want because things can happen in any order. We use this to try and mimic a more synchronous uh, application. So here I will, um, we've got our browser opened. We've got a, um, we've created a new page. I'm now going to do, I'll go to, and I'll open our link. I'll now take a screenshot of this page and I add an object which has the, and I'll call, I'll add this to a folder called screenshots and I'll just call this home dot. I'll now, Click on that link, and to get that link, I need the selector. I'll inspect this element. So I could just right click on here, copy the selector. And, and paste that in. And just to save time, I'll just copy and paste this code in. And save that. Um, so this is a really simple example. Um, I'm opening two different pages and taking screenshots. And to run that, I will just type in node, Drupal camp, the name of my file. And off it goes, it should open up um, the Chromium browser and, and take those screenshots. And let me have a look at the folder. Um, it's added two screenshots, one for home and one for schedule. So a really simple example. And if you are interested in getting started, this is kind of a hello world kind of demo. And I will share this link in the Slack channel where you can simply um, clone that repository and run NPM start. And you can add any website you want and you can take a, a series of screenshots. But you might be thinking, David, this is not automated tests. Um, what, why would I want to take screenshots of my my website. You could use this in automated tests where you take screenshots of before you, you make some refactoring changes, for example, and, and after. Um, but this, that was a, simple a very simple example where we're not using a testing framework. So the next example is using Jest. Um, it's just as easy to install. Um, you install Puppeteer. When you install Puppeteer, uh, I, I had to go and get a cup of coffee because it, it actually downloads the entire Chromium package. Um, Jest and Jest property are, are quite small packages to install. So let's have a look at another example. So I, um, here in our city in Peru, Arequipa, we run an English conversation club and um, people can register online for the club 
and it's quite a, a small registration form. And for us, that registration is really useful because we can then take attendance of students and we've got reports with attendance and we can also do follow up with, with, with students. And to add some automated tests to this, I've added some simple tests. So what we can do is automatically register a user and I will run one of those tests now by just following our test. And um, this takes a few seconds to run, takes about 10 seconds. Uh, it's running in headless mode, which means that we can't see what's happening, but the, the tests run in the background. It's, um, it's much faster running tests in headless mode, but if you're interested, you can also, uh, for debugging, um, run them in, in the normal mode. So I've just got three tests, and you can see that all three tests have passed. So let's have a look at, at this code. It's a little bit more work than uh, uh, the example that we looked at before. Close this one. And let's have a look at the, the test behind this, this example. So the three tests that we've got are um, be actually, before each test, I want to open the Arrow Keep English register page. The first thing I do is that is very simple. I just want to make sure, check that the, the title matches this. So the title should match create new user, uh, create new account. And I do this with, um, with this test here. The next step I do is I want to check. I have some very simple JavaScript that um, someone enters their first name, then their last name, and then I use some JavaScript to calculate the full name, the, the username. People can change that afterwards. And I want to test that that's, that's working okay. So I can fill in the values. So I'm adding in Kate Martin uh, and a date of birth. And I expect the, the full name to be Kate. Kate Martin. And the final test is, is a little bit more complete test where I run the, I register the user, I run through all the fields. Uh, and at the end, I check that the, um, that the process has gone through well by checking if this, the headline has, has been, um, the new heading is welcome directly by English. So let's watch this in uh, non headless mode. So I can if I need to de debug the process, it will open up Chromium, will open the page, and then go through each field. So I can do anything that I can do with, with Chromium myself, I can automate. So I, I'm able to upload. Um, files, I'm able to enter, enter fields. And you might, I don't know if you could see, but it was actually typing each letter uh, in a field, letter by letter. So if you've got on blur events, you've, you've got fields changing, then it should actually operate exactly as a browser would, would operate. So I don't know if you're interested in, in going into any of the, in, into the details of this, but if we have, have a look at the, the register user function, um, I've got a, a function that loops through fields. This bit was a little bit annoying because you need to, to get the ID or, or a selector for each field. And um, I found it e easier to put them into a single array where I've got the, um, all of the different fields. So for example, for um, the first name, I've got the, the selector, what type of field it is, and what kind of value I wanted to, wanted to add. And I've then got a, a function that, depending on what type of field it is, we'll use the um, use the correct method to enter that data into that, that field. Um, so that was a, just a, a quick demo of what is um, what's possible. I'm 
there's still a lot for me to learn. And the test coverage that we've got at the moment is quite minimal, but I found it really useful with forms. Sometimes um, you, you need to go through the process of creating, entering a form, maybe 10 or 20 times while you're developing something. And now um, with an automated test, that process can be much, much quicker. Also, it's, it, it can be very helpful with testing individual fields, but I think as a developer, we need to make a call on how, uh, how much time we want to invest now into setting up the automated test, depending how much time we think it might save us later. So for example, um, about five years ago, I was involved with a startup and it would take us literally 10 hours to test this, this application. And we would try and do a release every two weeks. And there were no one in that team wanted to, uh, to do the testing. Uh, and sometimes we would take shortcuts and skip parts of the testing. So we ended up having to test the application in different roles and then also test everything in, not just in desktop, but also in mobile. Um, so automated tests are a way um, to just streamline that process. So I'm open to questions. Um, I, I'm happy to make the code, any of the code that we've seen available, um, and also happy to hear some ideas on how I can move forward from here. I, I have a question. Um, thank you for the presentation, great. Um, so my last job, it wasn't a Drupal site, but they did, it was done in React.js and I was tasked with automating QA and ran into problems because React is so dynamic that trying to find selectors or whatever, which seem to change every time you click on the page got really tricky and I never actually figured it out. They closed down basically. Um, does this help with that? So what I've shown here are uh, end-to-end end -to -end tests. Mm -hmm. So um, with the Jest Puppeteer library, it does make it a lot easier with the selectors. So mm -hmm. I've used IDs, which is the, the simplest and the most robust way. Mm -hmm. But you can also say, let me see if I can find an example of this. You can say, for example, oh, I'm not showing my screen. To make it simple, your IDs can be a little bit annoying, mm -hmm. um, but to make things simple, we can say, there you go. Uh, in this particular H1, expect mm -hmm. this text. Mm -hmm. So it just makes the process of writing the tests simpler. And if a, a developer needs to change an ID, you don't end up breaking, breaking the test. And React has, has its own uh, testing framework mm -hmm. uh, and its own testing library that works with 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 Jest. It's mm -hmm. called the React Testing Library, and you can do things like shallow sh uh, shallow rendering. So with a component, um, a component might actually have fifty other components nested within it, within it. So you can do what's called a shallow render. So you can test just one component at a time. So if you if you're focused on React, for example. There is a whole um, set of a whole framework along with, with React. Okay. And it, so one one thought in that direction, Ian, is uh, we have the same problem in Drupal rendering with uh, form API that's come that's dealing with AJAX because of course IDs have to be unique, and so uh, Drupal uniqueifies to invent a, a verb uh, uh, IDs. Uh, by appending random strings onto the end of them, uh, when mm -hmm. the, like when a portion of the form is being replaced via AJAX, uh, and you'll notice in Drupal 8 form markup, uh, one way that problem is solved is by adding a uh, using HTML5 data properties. Um, there'll be a property added onto the form elements uh, Drupal data selector, um, mm -hmm. um, and that value doesn't change. Um, it's based upon the the name of the input uh, or structure of the form. So you could do something similar in another system. Uh, you'd have to do it yourself, but. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think a great place to start with it, with automated testing and a great presentation, David, um, mm -hmm. is uh, to ask yourself, you know, what's the critical path? What, what thing in this website, if it were broken, uh, we might as well just shut it down. Um, 
Uh, and so then that's that's where you focus your end to end testing first, uh, because you need you, really, you know if it's an e commerce site, you really need to have a cart and a checkout process. Uh, so maybe you'd start with that first. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, just want to, um, this, this is great for me because I really need to learn testing and I, I need to convince the people that I work for to do more testing. Um, so if I come back, if I, ha I have questions in a month, like let's say I, I get time to do this in a month, how can I ask you, like, I, I just, you know, fine tuning all the details because I, the basics, the hello world, I could probably figure out, but then I'm like, well, how do I test this kind of detail or what? just trying to figure out what it is I should be testing for. Cause I could test for anything, everything, you know? I, I think Sean's answer on what, what you should test is a, is a good idea. Uh, I will give, I will show a screen with my email address and I'll put that in the Slack channel as well. I'm really happy to chat with people because I think the more examples I can see, the more I, I will learn. Um, and so, Puppeteer is actually quite straightforward, but I found testing to be complicated. So things like the timing, the way that the tests run, uh, everything tries to run asynchronously. So sometimes tests can be flaky where they work sometimes, but not other times, and that can be really annoying. But let me share my screen again. Um, and I've also got some resources that might be, might be helpful. So... While you're bringing that up, David, would you be interested in having an ongoing conversation with people about uh, automated testing in our in our community Slack? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, uh, one thing we can offer if people are interested is we I mean we we can make a automated testing channel. Um, uh, if people want to talk about automated testing in Drupal NYC Slack. It's very easy to do. Cool. And so here's my email address and. I've also got some resources that, that I found really helpful. And I think it, it really is helpful seeing a lot of examples because especially with forms, there are so many different ways, so many different type, form types that we can have. And often we have JavaScript connected with forms uh, and it hasn't been as simple as I had hoped at the start. Um, so hopefully I can share some of my pain and um, listen to the pains of other people as well. But I, yeah, I will post, post uh, the slides immediately after. Oh, okay. cool. Thanks, Sean, for creating that. Channel, channel created. Um, post a link in the Meetup Slack also. So is anyone else interested in doing automated tests? Oh, cool. So I too have recently released a module and one of, the, one of the drivers for me was to realizing that in the future, if I don't start creating the automated test now, it's gonna create a lot of complication for me later on. This would tie in nicely with uh, JD did a presentation recently on, I think it was GitHub workflows and your automated tests could be part of that. I think you wouldn't yes. deploy to the next stage until your tests had completed successfully. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Uh, thank you for getting our lunchtime conversations off to uh, off to a good start. Um, uh, it's uh, it's our hypothesis that this might be a, a, another time in the month that would be fruitful for a different segment of our community to connect who uh, can't necessarily take time away in the evening. Uh, so uh, let me share our upcoming events. Um, we have uh, uh, the regular evening meetup, uh, uh, first Wednesday, the May 5th. And uh, we will be doing this again on Tuesday, uh, May 18th. And so hopefully you'll spread the word and you'll be able to join us. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you uh, either have something to share um, or uh, you know someone that 
you realize they have something to share and they're a little bit reluctant. Uh, they don't, you know, they have this idea that you have to be uh, somewhere in the stratosphere to share uh, uh, at Drupal NYC. You might encourage them that this is a community of mutual mentoring and support, and they should they should volunteer to share something cool that they're doing. Uh, and with that, uh, we would bring our uh, the official part of our first uh, lunchtime gathering uh, uh, to a conclusion. Uh, people are welcome to stay and uh, um, and hang out or go about their day. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers and the organizers. Thank uh, you. Our pleasure. Thank you, organizers, too. Cool. All right, have a good day. Thank you, Sean. Bye bye. Thank you, Sean. See you. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.